Warning, today's episode contains themes and language that is unsuitable for children or educated peoples. Here, Stan, this is for you. you. Listener discretion is advised. This is the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Rish Outfield. That's me. Hi, Doggy. Big Anklevich. No, it's not true. Don't even ask. What's new with you? And I'm the ever competent announcer man. You got to tear me apart, Lisa. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our most vomitrocious episode ever. And let me tell you, that's saying a lot. Ah, uh, come now. Vomitastic. This is Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And this is the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine? Magazine. What episode are we on? We are on episode 92. What is our... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little out of it right now. What what story Why is Why are this? you a little out of it? I'm, I'm confused. Looks like your hair is kind of sticking up in odd angles and your eyes are kind of watering. Have you been drinking... No, quite the opposite. Oh, what what is the opposite of drinking? Well, I, I suppose there could be more than one opposite, but uh, I'm talking about the... Uh, the opposite of intake? Yes. <laughs> you weren't ingesting anything, you were... Ex-gesting. Ex-gesting. Suggesting. He was suggesting a few things. Yes, Rish Outfield is being a trooper for us today. He just spent uh, several minutes uh, puking in the snow outside my house. And uh, he said, you know, now I'm back up to at least 90%. (laughs) That was then. (laughs) Yeah, I wish we had thought to just start recording immediately. Yeah, we probably should have because now he's settled back into uh, near-death experience levels. Well, you know, it's it's my own fault because we sat down to record a story and I said, nah, let's watch something instead. And so we watched something on the TV and about midway through I started to get sick and we just watched it through to the end. And uh, if we had just recorded that stuff, then I could have been sick afterward. Yeah. Or in the middle. That would have even been more fun. Come on. Oh, geez. This may be actually the most puke-tastic episode we'll do it as a challenge to see how long i can sit here and yeah before i knew i wouldn't make it to the bathroom so i just ran out the front door and uh, into the snow and luckily there's tons of snow yeah but come spring it's gonna be awful fragrant out there oh i'm sure the grass will be all the greener in that little corner <laughs> anyways we have a story today don't we we do that sometimes Not every time, it turns out. Not often, no. But most times. (laughs) What is the story, Our story this week is from a returning author. Our man, Jason Sanford, sent us out a new uh, offering for us. The story is called Plague Birds. Poor guy. He sent us a story that we liked, and it got scooped up by another podcast that will never run it. At least... That seems to be their, their history. But, boy, Jason was a, a trooper, and he immediately sent us another story. This is just out of nowhere, huh? We've, we're supposed to be doing the author. About the about author. The author. Oh. oh. Jason Sanford is the uh, author of a number of short stories, essays, and articles. He's a member of the SFWA. Which is? Science Fiction Writers of America. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> He was born in the South and currently lives in the Midwest. He's published many short stories in Interzone, Analog, Orson Scott Card's Intergalactic Medicine Show, The Mississippi Review, Pindelbibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibibib
<laughs> right. Well, well, let me know uh, who helped us with this episode, if you would. Well, certainly. We'd like to thank L. Scribe Harris, Abigail Hilton, Norm Sherman, R. E. Chambliss, no way, Stacy Dukes, John Riendo, and Liz Lincoln for lending their voices to today's episode. Who gave us the music? Off the top of my head, I'd say the music came from MDT Music. Uh, you can check out the links for them on the show notes. Also, we'd like to thank Brian Lincoln for producing today's episode and making it as wonderful as it has turned out to be. I believe that dude even created some of the sound effects for the episode. I'd be willing to bet that he With did. his own body. And the food from his refrigerator. Is that right? Yeah, that's the funnest for oh, creating. Don't mention food. Oh, that's right. You better go. Uh, on with the story. Enjoy. Plague Birds by Jason Sanford. All morning, Christina de Ain battled her mule as they plowed furrow after furrow of stenching black dirt. This was Krista's first time working the wheat field since the attack. An egg beater took full advantage of her injured body, continually stopping and starting, turning left or right, and destroying every attempt to plow a straight line. As the cool spring morning warmed today, the mule finally refused to move, pushing Krista's loop in rage too far. She screamed at Egg Beater, who brayed with laughter, causing Krista to kick the ceramic plow in disgust with her lame right leg. Embarrassed, she glanced around the field, praying no one had witnessed her outburst, only to see Boat and Poller walking along the nearby road. Bo waved, the fool acting for all the world as if they were still best friends. Rip his throat out. Split his guts and spine. Krista gasped as the wolf surged her thoughts. She fell to her knees, fingers gouging dank plowed earth, and spun into dreams of chasing Bo down and tearing him to blood and meat. She wanted Bo and Pollard to pay for what he did, wanted him to roll in pain, to scream for forgiveness. But she knew if she lost control, she'd be little better than him. Breathing deep to calm herself, Krista grabbed the plow handles and pulled herself back up. She glared at the road, daring Bo to pretend any friendship still existed between the two of them. But Bo was already gone. Instead, a deadly flash of red danced along the road, coming to a stop right beside the field. Krista froze, only to be jerked forward as Egg Beater chose this moment to move. She cursed the mule and yanked the reins, but by the time she looked back, the red had disappeared. Krista gripped the reins with suddenly sweaty palms. Was it a plague bird? The mule, sensing her fear, brayed nervously. Krista pulled a carrot from her pocket and fed it to Egg Beater to quiet him, then stood on the plow for a better look. Her lame leg shook with pain, and she gripped the plow's handles to keep from falling. The red flash was gone. Had it been an optical illusion? Or one of the rare, unmodified cardinals which still nested in the nearby hills, their feathers as obscenely red as red could be? Krista stepped down from the plow to unhitch Egg Beater. Perhaps it was nothing, or perhaps it was a very dangerous thing hiding itself from her eyes. To be safe, she'd return to the barn. Krista bent under the mule to unstrap his harness. When she looked back up, the plague bird stood beside her, waving a fresh carrot under Egg Beater's nose. Hello, Christina de Ain, the woman said. I require a place to stay for a few days. Krista couldn't speak. She stared at the woman's scary stalk of red-burned hair, at the red line glowing from right eye to lips, at the twin red knives sheathed to her red-trousered thighs. Most of all, Krista stared at the woman's pale skin. She could almost see through that paleness to the deadly blood screaming and cursing its way through her veins. There's nothing to be afraid of, the woman said in a tired voice, obviously repeating words she'd spoken many times in her travels. My name is Darina. Now, please finish unharnessing your mule and take me to your father. The woman laid her hand on Krista's shoulder. Krista flinched and stepped back, causing her lame leg to spasm and dump her in the dirt. 
A gentle smile splashed Arena's face as she reached out to pull Krista up. No one else noticed Arena as she followed Krista and Eggbeater through the village commons, a fact which unnerved Krista, though she'd known this would happen. Last year, at her 18th birthday party, the village's artificial intelligence had manipulated Krista's senses in a game of hide the kiss. She remembered standing before the young men and women of the village as Blue tickled her mind. Suddenly, she couldn't see her friends. She heard them step to her side one by one, felt their unseen lips on her cheek as the villagers laughed and hooted, but she only saw empty air as she tried in vain to guess which invisible kiss belonged to which person. If Blue could do that, so could the deadly AI this plague bird hid inside her blood. Krista glanced at Blue's single-room schoolhouse. The rainbow lights and twinkling fog of the AI hovered protectively in front of the school, while twenty kids of different ages kicked an old ball in a tangle of dust and shouts. Krista knew Blue saw the plague bird, even though the AI didn't react to the woman's presence. Krista wanted to run to Blue to feel the cool, enveloping crackle of its energy across her skin, but the AI was forbidden to interfere with a plague bird's duties, so Krista simply led Darina on. Krista's father repaired leather saddles and reins each day in the village barn, and sure enough, she heard him whistling inside. As Krista entered the barn, her father looked up from his workbench. Let me guess, he said with a grin. Eggbeater performed his special circular plowing. Normally, Krista would have laughed. They called the mule Eggbeater because he'd plow circles if given half a chance. But instead, she ran around the workbench and grabbed her father's hand. His brown beard and stringy hair bristled as his wolf anger rose. Where's that son of a bitch, Bo? He began. His words died off as Darina allowed him to see her. Krista's father nodded to himself. Go raise the plague flag, he told his daughter. But only elders touch the flags. People will understand. Krista ran as fast as her lame leg could manage to the giant flagpole in the middle of the commons. She opened the ceramic box at the pole's base, strung a red flag to the cable, and pulled it to the top of the pole so everyone would know a plague bird was here. When she looked back down, the villagers and school kids who'd been milling around were running for their houses. Only Blue remained. As Krista limped home, the AI washed a wave of apology in and out of her mind. Although what Blue needed to apologize for, Krista couldn't say. That evening, Krista sat on the wood stairs in her house, listening to the elders in the living room. Her father served as chief elder and had invited the council to meet here. I want to know why a plague bird has appeared, boomed Ms. Poller as always her deep voice overpowering her sapling stick of a body. It's been decades since a crime of merit occurred in our village. I wouldn't call your son's assault on Krista without merit, Krista's father said, irritated. But you are correct. There's been no unpunished crime to warrant a plague bird's judgment. The other elders nodded in agreement as Blue's haze of energy and lights twinkled from beside the brick chimney. I remind you that plague birds also visit without cause, Blue whispered in their minds. They keep a watch on all the villages as we AIs return people to humanity. When the last one visit? Krista's father asked. Three years ago, although only I noticed him, Blue said. Plague birds are extremely long-lived and visit our village regularly as they wander this land. Of course, the last significant visit we had was a century ago. The elders grumbled nervously. Oh, that plague bird had killed a quarter of the village. Since then, every villager's education included experiencing the hell plague birds unleashed if capital crimes went unpunished. Krista remembered the first time she witnessed Blue's memories of those long-ago villagers. How the plague bird's AI tore their bodies to meat and bone. Blue had tried to stop the plague bird, only to have its consciousness ripped apart and painfully stitched back together. A clear warning that the plague bird could have destroyed Blue if he'd desired. Fear. Scared sense. Mouth silent screaming. 
Krista closed her eyes to silence the memory. Krista smelled the elder's urine-tinged sweat, felt the nervous static from Blue, and knew everyone was reliving the same memories as she. Well, where is this woman? Ms. Poller muttered. In our guest room, resting, Krista's father said. She's exhausted, perhaps ill. Ms. Poller sputtered in anger. She's staying in your house? What do you plan to do, beg her to kill my son? Krista scented the wolf rising in her father, and for a moment thought he'd attack Ms. Poller. Several elders growled as they sensed the same peril. But instead of attacking, Krista's father calmed himself. Tell them, Blue, he said. The plague bird intends to visit a hunter clan in the surrounding forests and desires Krista to guide her. The AI intoned. The plague bird also has an interest in Bo's attack on Krista, an interest we can do nothing to stop. Ms. Poller's face blanched as Krista stood up to protest. She didn't want this so-called interest. She wanted the plague bird to leave her alone. But Blue whispered in Krista's mind to remain quiet. So she did. That's when Krista knew she had less choice now than she did in the days and months after Bo's attack. That night, Krista sat on her bedroom's windowsill, feet dangling over the second-story drop. Krista loved the night, all moon glow and tangy forest scents, and the urge to run howling after the hunt. Not that Blue and the elders approved of such base actions. Although she was sure all the villagers had sneaked away at one time or another for just such a thrill, Krista glanced at the flickering candlelight in the guest bedroom window beside her. The pressed glass showed only the room's empty bed and furniture, but Krista's instincts whispered that the unseen plague bird stood before the window, watching. Suddenly, a familiar scent washed over Krista. Gentle kiss, bow muzzling neck, mating urge, what's so sweet in spring? Krista ignored the wolf's pleasant memories, instead growling a warning as she leaned forward on the windowsill, ready to attack. Bo stepped from the dark trees a stone's throw from the house. His hands held up in surrender. What do you want? Krista whispered. She didn't want to wake up her father, who would likely kill Bo for being so near their home. I was passing by and saw you on the window. Reminded me of good times. Krista smiled as she remembered the spring night a year ago when they'd last met this way. She'd leapt from her second-story window to chase him through the dark forest finally cornering him beneath a fallen hickory. Krista sighed. She and Bo had been best friends all of their lives, and she'd always believed they'd one day marry. When Bo kept control, he was a lovely man. But the problem was that as Bo aged, his pox-gened tendencies worsened despite Blue's constant tinkering. Finally, last fall, he broke. He and Krista were walking around one of the wheat fields at night, holding hands and watching the clouds play slash and hide with the moon. Suddenly, Bo attacked her. He smashed her face over and over and shattered her leg before catching himself, a gasp of horror in his yellow, glowing eyes. The elders had restrained Krista's father for several days to keep him from killing Bo, while Bo himself said he deserved to die for his actions. However, the other elders decided against that punishment, reminding everyone the pox had gened Bo so badly not even the AI could make him whole. They branded his right hand and warned him he'd be killed if he lost control again. Now Bo stood below Krista, seeking forgiveness for something she'd never forgive. Get out of here before my father scents you, Krista said. You know what he'll do. Bo nodded, bowing with a dramatic flare as he backed into the woods. A dark figure grabbed Bo and kissed him with a female growl before bolting into the dark. Bo looked sadly at Krista before chasing after the woman. Krista wondered which village girl risked Bo again losing control. She tried to convince herself she no longer cared. As Krista pulled her numb leg back into the room, she glanced a final time into the guest bedroom. The candle there flickered and disappeared as unseen lips blew it out. Krista shivered. She realized Ms. Poller's fears were right. The plague bird was here to kill Bo. As Krista fell asleep under her bed's warm quilts, 
She asked the wolf whether Bo's death would make any difference to the life she still had to live. Yes. No. Yes. Confusion. The wolf whined so much that Krista gave up her question and simply joined it in running through the forests of her dreams. While only a few hundred people resided in the village proper, over a thousand hunters lived in settlements throughout the nearby forests and hills. In the morning, during a breakfast of hot oatmeal, Darina announced that Krista would guide her to the Farnham settlement, one of the most secretive of the hunter clans. Krista and her father exchanged nervous looks. Uh, that's a long way for my daughter to walk on her bad leg, Krista's father said. Plus... The Farnums don't like outsiders. No one likes me, Dorina said. But we're still going. Krista's father clenched his fists in irritation, <sighs> struggling to remain calm. He walked to a closet and returned with an ancient ceramic pistol. Krista reached for the gun, both honored her father would let her wear it, and nervous he thought it necessary. However, Dorina said no. She goes unarmed. Blood boiled her father's face, and he literally shook. Unable to speak, he hugged Krista tight and stalked out of the house. He has good control, Darina said. I like that in a man. Krista turned away, not wanting to reveal how badly her own instincts screamed to join her father in ripping the plague bird's throat to bloody shreds. Krista picked up her wooden crutch. While she didn't need it now, she would after an hour or two of hiking, and led Darina down the old cement road, now so cracked and overgrown it was little more than a footpath. Krista had often been tempted to hike the road to the next village, which lay only a few days' walk from here, but only plague birds and hunters traveled as they liked. All villagers remained under the watchful presence of their AI unless otherwise directed. It was difficult enough keeping control during the day-to-day -day irritations of life, but to travel beyond the calming reach of your AI, that would truly risk one's hard-won humanity. A mile from the village, they passed Bo, returning home from his previous night's fun with his unknown woman. Krista scented sex on him, and even though she told herself not to be jealous, a slick of vomit coated her mouth. Suddenly, Krista's head tingled and Bo's face flushed to fear. He stared at Darina, for the first time seeing her bright red hair and clothes. Like a rabbit bolting from a hungry coyote, Bo ran down the road toward the village. He still loves you, Darina said. And your village AI is correct. His love borders on obsession. Krista's lips quivered as she remembered Bo standing over her body, smashing and slashing as blood played across his face. Why did you reveal yourself to him? If I'm by myself, I desire people to see me only when necessary. But since you're here, people need to know that if they hurt you, they'll answer to me. Krista didn't ask any more questions. Soon, they reached the trail leading into the forested hills. Krista leaned on her crutch as she glanced up the dim, narrow path. She'd only been here once, when she was fifteen and her father led a group of villagers in bringing an injured hunter back to his clan. She'd been shocked at how the hunters lived, in old, cramped houses and shacks, far from the ability of an AI to protect their body or mind. Now, as she stared up the leaf-greened trail, she imagined a thousand lunatics like Bo hiding behind every tree waiting to kill her. Sensing Krista's fear, Darina removed her red leather vest and one of her hip knives and handed them to Krista. So everyone knows you're with me, Darina said. Krista's hands shook as she held the forbidden items, but she knew Darina was right. She pulled the vest on, strapped the knife to her uninjured thigh, and led the plague bird through the woods. They were being watched. Dark shapes flickered and merged with the shadowed oaks and elms lining the trail. 
Hot scents of territory and trespass burned on the breeze. Scents so strong, Krista almost choked on the air. Adding to the terror, the plague bird was in terrible shape, turning an hour's hike into two. Every few minutes, she stopped to catch her breath. And as they rested, Krista imagined the hunters choosing this moment of weakness to attack. When they neared the Farnham settlement, an angry voice ordered them to leave these woods. Darina pulled her knife from its hip sheath, but instead of pointing it at the voice, she held the blade to her wrist. The voice fell silent, and Krista and Darina hiked on. The Farnham settlement was built into the side of a hill, eight cement and wood houses beside a level plot of ground from which grew several massive oaks. Even though the noon sun beat down, only the barest ripple of sunlight fingered through the thick canopy. Krista's boots clicked over the rubble-cracked asphalt and dust of an ancient road, a reminder of long-gone times when a massive city occupied all these lands, and how millions died when that city was pulled down by hand and claw and tooth. But such historic thoughts fled when Krista saw the hunters, before Krista stood at least 50 men, women, and children of the Farnham clan, with their clan leader, a massively muscled man in a white lion's mane of hair in front. While they looked mostly human, Krista saw the pox's continued genetic manipulation. The eyes of all the hunters glowed with enhanced vision, while a number paced nervously from side to side as if cats instead of men. Many showed the stripes and fur of cat, wolf, and bear. In the ruins of the old road sat a heavy wooden table holding food and drink. Obviously, the clan desired to demonstrate hospitality to their unwanted visitors. The white-maned clan leader stepped toward them. I am Master Farnham, he said. Welcome to our clan hold. Darina laughed. This is a first, she said. No one ever welcomes my presence. We are all human, no matter our differences. Please, sit and talk. Darina and Krista and Master Farnham sat down, with the plague bird and clan leader eyeing each other like animals sizing up who was prey and who was hunt. I am here because there are rumors your clan has broken the agreed-upon laws, Darina said. And not simply broken... Is it true that you killed off Clan Harreen? Several of the hunters watching them growled a low, wolverine-like warning. Master Farnham slammed his massive fist onto the wooden table to silence them, then apologized to Darina. They're not used to outsiders saying what we can or cannot do, he said. But our golden rule is to never attack or harass the villagers. We live as neighbors with them. We have broken none of your damn laws. Darina leaned over to Master Farnham and whispered, I think you have. One of your clan has meddled in village business. Master Farnham's face tightened, and he roared for everyone to leave his sight. Leave my sight. Many of the men and women and children hissed and muttered, and one young woman charged at Darina, <coughs> causing the plague bird to pull her knife. Before the girl reached the table, Master Farnham jumped up and smashed her in the face with his powerful fist. The girl fell, unconscious in the dust. Urgh. Take her to the house, he ordered as several wild-eyed young women dragged the girl away. My daughter, he explained as he sat down beside Darina. The pox gened her with my temper and her mother's rage. <laughs> he laughed a little at the joke but fell silent when Darina didn't join in. Master Farnham lowered his voice. We are a good people. We keep to ourselves and only attack if attacked. Clan Harine raided the herbs we grow and the game we hunt. They even attacked one of my children. So yes, we killed them. But that is permitted. Darina nodded, as if debating these people's crimes with a voice in her head. But killing off an entire clan is extreme. Tell me, is it true you spared their children and took them in? Master Farnham stroked his mane nervously. Of course. Despite our genes, we're not animals. They will be raised as part of Clan Farnham. Do you wish to see the kids, to know they're being taken care of? 
Darina placed a red knife on the table. No, she said. I wish to know it. Master Farnham stood up, knocking his chair to the dust and rubble. Absolutely not, he bellowed. We are a free people. We refuse to be sheep for any damn AI. We refuse to be judged on who is human by those without claim to humanity. Darina didn't argue, but she picked the knife up and rested its tip gently against her arm. Krista remembered the histories Blue had shown her of the plague bird a century ago. How that man cut his artery, spurting an arch of blood which grew and grew until the villagers began dying. Flee! Flee! No talk! Flee! In animal panic, Krista jumped from the table, but her bad leg threw her onto the broken asphalt. Above her, Darina stared without emotion at Master Farnham. Are you going to make me beg? Master Farnham asked, his face twitching as he fought for control. I'm going to judge you, or every member of your clan dies right now. Master Farnham took a deep breath and extended his right hand to Darina. With a quick motion, Darina pricked her palm with the knife and grabbed Master Farnham's hand. Even though Darina moved too fast for Krista to see any blood, a slight buzzing ran through her mind. Just like when Blue reached into her, Krista remembered Blue's teachings about plague birds how their blood contained an incredibly powerful AI which cared only for basic rules of right and wrong. As long as the AI was contained in a plague bird, it was harmless. But release it, and it rendered instant and deadly judgment on everyone nearby. Master Farnham's eyes rolled as his massive body tensed and shook. Darina stared into nothingness for long seconds before releasing his hand causing Master Farnham to collapse against the wooden table, gasping for breath as if he'd run a thousand miles. Darina wiped a slick of sweat off her forehead. I'm glad you told the truth, Darina said. I will not punish your clan for the killings, but that leaves the matter of the person who meddled in village affairs. Master Farnham started to speak, but something behind Darina caught his eye. He screamed, No! as a young man with glowing eyes raced by Krista, a pistol in his hand, his whiskered face as focused and intense as the panthers which hunted the village fields. The man raised the pistol to Darina and shot her in the back, a spray of blood exiting between her breasts. Darina turned to her attacker, pain and fury on her face. She kicked the young man backward, then pointed at him and shouted, Not them! Him. Only him. For a moment, the bloody mist in the air around Darina wavered, demanding more before acquiescing and raining onto the young man. The air quivered to tears of justice as the man thrashed and screamed for mercy, but the AI gave none. It exploded the man's lungs into shreds of pink tissue and ate its way through his brain, all the while refusing to let him die. Finally, after a forever screech of pain, the man's body ripped in half from head to legs, and the cloud of blood returned to Darina's body. The bullet wound in her chest closed as if by magic, until only a puckered scar and a hole in her red shirt showed where the projectile had hit. Master Farnham roared a deep lion's scream of anguish. He fell on all fours and pounded the broken pavement with his fists before finally regaining control. The fool had it coming, he yelled at his clan folk. You know the rules. The hunters growled in fear, but they stared at the splash of blood and tissue soaking the ground and didn't attack. Master Farnham crawled over to Darina and kneeled before her. Please forgive us. He whispered, his angry eyes glowing fire. The boy wasn't thinking. He wanted to defend my honor and forgot the consequences. Darina nodded and said the young man's actions wouldn't count against Master Farnham's clan. But there is still the matter of the person who interfered with village affairs. I will return in two days to deal with that. I suggest you impress upon your people the need to avoid a repeat of this tragic affair. With that... Darina walked back down the trail. Krista stared at the people around her as the hairs on her neck stood up. Several hunters held back Master Farnham's daughter, who had woken up 
and now howled in inhuman anger, fighting to reach and kill Krista. Suddenly, deeply afraid, Krista picked up her crutch and hobbled after Darina. Once they were clear of the forest and back on the old cement road, Darina sat down hard in the sunlight. She took the red knife and vest back from Krista and sighed. <sighs> that took a lot out of me, she said. Keeping the AI from killing all those people. Did you have to kill that man? I didn't want to. But if I hadn't given the AI someone who dared attack me directly, it would have gone berserk. With my body so weak, there are limits to how well I can control it. Must you go back there in two days? They'll be in an angry mood. Master Farnham might not be able to hold them back. It's worse than you know. That young man was Master Farnham's son. As we left, he was debating whether or not to give in to his animal side and attack us, even if it meant the death of everyone he loved. Krista glanced at the giant trees growing along the road as the breeze blew to the whispering pad of angry animals. Darina didn't hide herself from people's sight when they finally reached the village, causing Krista's neighbors and friends to stare at the woman in fear and shock. Krista led Darina to the house and helped her up the stairs to the guest room, where the plague bird collapsed into bed. She said she didn't want to be disturbed, then closed her eyes and fell asleep. Not sure how to help the plague bird, Krista sought out her father, who was in the village barn with several of the elders, including Ms. Poller. Krista told them what happened. The Farnham clan will kill us, Ms. Poller whispered. Krista's father shook his head. I doubt they'll attack with a plague bird here. Still, it'd be wise to post an armed watch tonight. The other elders agreed and began discussing plans for how to deal with the Farnham clan. Krista, knowing she was no longer needed, walked out of the barn. Bo waited outside for her. Are you okay? Bo asked. I heard what you told the elders. Krista smiled at Bo's concern, which etched so sincerely across his lean string bean of a face. But she also saw the memory of Bo attacking her with animal hunger of her blood spraying across that same lanky face. She cursed humanity for playing genetic god so long ago, resulting in people so warm and human one moment, all animal and anger the next. I'm fine, Krista said. But seeing that man torn apart by the AI? I forget what Blue showed us about plague birds. This was worse, far worse. Bo reached out to hug Krista jumping a low growl from Krista's throat. Bo stepped back cautiously. There's nothing I can say to make up for what I did, he said. And you're right not to trust me. It's becoming harder to stay in control. Sometimes I go running in the woods and know that's who I am. A hunter, not a villager. Krista gripped Bo's hands, causing a ripple of passion in his eyes which almost overwhelmed him. She also fought for control, shouting through her mind as animal impulses raced by. Mate. Flee. Fight. <sighs> she smelled the barest touch of last night's sex on Bo, and her thighs shook. Bo, I've always loved you, and you're a good man when you're in control. But every time I see your face, I remember what you did. I can't get past that. Maybe one day you will. Bo said, hopefully. Maybe, Krista said. But even as she said the word, she remembered the anger which flashed in Master Farnham's eyes when Darina killed his son. Some things you couldn't put behind you, no matter how hard you tried. The next morning, Darina stayed in her room, so Krista was free to do her chores. Even though her leg hurt from the previous day's hike, she and her father finished plowing their field and sowing it with modified wheat. At noon, they sat in the shade of a giant oak beside the old road, eating beans and cold meat, and talking about harvesting the quick-growing wheat in a few months. Soon they fell to simply watching clouds scud the hot sky. That was how Blue found them. How goes the day? Krista's father asked. Very well. 
The hunters don't appear to be planning an attack. At least, they are staying out of my sensing range. And the plague bird is sleeping. Restraining her AI drained her in his body more than I realized. Krista gazed at Blue's haze of consciousness, which bent the streaming sunlight into strange tints of rainbow colors. Blue almost seemed in a good mood, if an AI could be said to have moods. Then she remembered the rage in the plague bird's AI, and realized that, yes indeed, these entities had all the moods they wanted. You desire to ask something, Blue stated. When Darina released her AI yesterday, it seemed so angry. But I've never seen you mad. Why is that AI so different? We're all different, the same as humans. But why did people create something as evil as a plague bird's AI? Blue expanded outward until the AI's lights reached the top of the oak tree, before collapsing back into its normal cloudlet of haze. Krista had been around Blue enough to know that was its equivalent of a sigh. What I've taught the villagers about history is correct, but there's a difference between knowing something and experiencing thousands of years of it. Humanity had changed beyond all recognition due to excessive genetic manipulation, resulting in insanity and chaos on a massive scale. So many human-animal hybrids were created without a care to what they brought to this world. To seek a return to order, one group of humans created empathic AIs like myself to watch over and guide pockets of humanity back to your original ungene state. Others, seeking justice for perceived wrongs, created absolute AIs to dispense punishment. There were also the hybrid humans who liked their gene lives and didn't want to give them up. So a balance was created. The hunters could live their lives within certain constraints, while AIs like myself would attempt to return isolated segments of humanity to their original state. And the plague birds? Krista asked. The only true balance is between three parts, so we needed the absolute AIs to enforce the agreement. But they're so harsh we couldn't trust them to freely roam the land. We placed them within the bodies of human volunteers, who keep control of the AI's power. The plague birds restrain their AIs except when a judgment is needed. Krista had never heard humanity's history explained in such stark terms. From the look on her father's face, he had neither. Why are you telling us this? She asked. Because trouble has entered our village. And while Darina has held her AI in for many centuries, her body is weakening. She won't be able to contain it much longer. For a moment, Krista didn't understand what she was hearing, but her father did. He jumped up and howled no, no. and a scream ripped no. straight from his wolf jeans. He grabbed Krista's hand and dragged her away from Blue, muttering, No, no, hell not, no. Krista's father calmed down before they reached home, but he refused to serve dinner to the plague bird. So Krista cooked a simple meal of eggs and rice and carried the plate to the guest bedroom. She knocked on the wooden door, and Darina said enter. The plague bird sat in the wicker chair Krista's mother had crafted in her dying days, as her pox-sickened jeans turned against her body. Darina had the same look as her mother did then, exhausted and worn but refusing to back down until the final painful breath. Blue told you, she said, not asking, simply knowing. Yes, but why me? Darina smiled as she unbuttoned her red shirt to show the puckered scar where she'd been shot. I haven't healed right, she said. A century ago, a shot like that wouldn't have left a mark. Hell, the AI once healed me after my head got blown near off. Krista felt a burn of pain shoot through her leg and she wondered if the plague bird's AI could heal it, maybe even end the other pains and fears and confusions which hit her every time she saw Bo's face. How old are you? I've been carrying the AI for over 2,000 years, killed far more people than I need to remember, but I've also helped to keep the peace, a simple fact that I can live with. Krista tried to imagine all the things this woman had seen in her time. For a moment... The thought of becoming a plague bird excited her, until she remembered the dead man from yesterday. She shook her head in disgust. Again, why me? 
because I need someone who doesn't desire what I do. Someone who will fight the AI inside her, only let it out when absolutely necessary. I'm sorry, but I won't do this. Darina nodded sadly. That's exactly why I want you. Still, it must be your choice. You should know that if you don't do this, Bo will kill you. Krista jumped back, a wolf growl in her throat. What? He loves you, yes. But his condition is rapidly progressing as his genes force him through changes that Blue can no longer control. The problem, though, is that Bo obsesses on you. No matter how he fights it, he wants you. Blue is correct that one day, when Boaten Pauler's animal side gains control, he will kill you. Then you must kill Bo. No. I only kill for the actions people do, not for what they may do. But Blue was right to call me here. If this isn't handled properly, many people, both villagers and hunters, will die. That night, Krista stood among the newly planted furrows of her family's wheat field, leaning on her crutch as she kicked the dark soil with her good foot. Above, a quarter moon shone in the clear night sky, stirring the wolf inside Krista to excitement. She remembered Blue's history lessons, how humans once walked on that milky world. She wondered if humans would ever do so again. Krista heard a faint rustle from under the dark fence-lined trees beside the field. She couldn't see anything, and wished she still had the gened eyes of her ancestors. The faintest of growls reached her as a black shape stepped from the trees and charged. Krista stood calmly, refusing to flee. Suddenly, night turned to day. Above her, blue burned like a tiny sun, casting white flicker shadows across the field and surrounding trees. Bo looked up in shock, clawing at his night eyes as he stumbled over the furrows. Krista dropped her crutch and grabbed the net at her feet and threw it over Bo as her father and Darina appeared next to her. Blue had blocked their sight and scent from Bo's senses. There's another, Darina said, pointing at the trees. In the beam of Blue's light, Krista saw a hunter, Master Farnham's daughter, who tried to attack Darina the other day. The girl bolted, running amazingly fast, but other villagers appeared from where Blue had cloaked their presence and tackled her. She howled and bit and rolled, but they held her fast. By the time Bo and the girl were dragged before Darina, Ms. Poller had run to the scene. She fell to her knees before the plague bird. Please, she pleaded. He's still my son. Darina shook her head. He tried to attack Krista. Your own elders agreed that if he did it again, the punishment was death. However, he's not the only culpable person here. For the first time, Ms. Poller noticed the hunter girl beside her son. It appears Master Farnham's daughter is interested in your son, Miss Poller, Darina said. She's been encouraging his animal side, pushing him to attack Krista, no doubt trying to remove a rival for his affections. Then my son isn't at fault, Ms. Poller said. Everyone's at fault, Darina said in a tired voice. All that matters is who ends up dying. Krista thought Darina would wait until morning to kill Bo and the hunter girl, but instead the plague bird demanded the villagers immediately drag the two of them to the Farnham settlement. Are you insane? Krista's father yelled. They barely control their animal sides during the daytime. They'll attack if we enter their land at night, and if that happens, we'll also lose control. Darina pulled her knife out, and with the razor point picked at the puckered scar on her chest. The villagers glanced nervously at one another before binding the hands of Bo and the hunter girl and starting up the road. Krista watched them lead Bo away, relieved she no longer had to fear him, but also sad. Knowing what was about to happen, Krista. Bo called her name in a low, pitiful Krista. moan. He looked terrified, Krista. and Krista turned away as the wolf inside whined and begged her to free their friend and lover. You must also go, Blue said in her mind. You must see this through to the end. If I watch Bo die, I don't know if I can keep control, she said. Trust me, 
Blue said. You'll have control. Krista nodded and hobbled on her crutch after the villagers. Blue lit their way, a moving sun chasing off shadows. Darina could barely walk and leaned on Krista's father for support, more so when they entered the perfect black of the forest and wound their way up the hilly trail. Hunters howled and shrieked in the darkness, and every villager huddled close to the protection of Blue's light, fearful of both the hunters and their own reactions to the bloodlust all around them. As they neared the settlement, the roaring voice of Master Farnham asked why his clan shouldn't why kill them right my now. Clan kill you right now. We didn't want to come, Krista's father yelled back. The plague bird forced us. She has your daughter. Silence paused the night. Darina motioned for the villagers to continue. When they reached the old road before the houses, Krista saw the hunters pacing back and forth in an agitated state. If they'd been scary in the daylight, now they were terrifying. Their eyes glowed fire to Blue's illumination, and their throats crackled in hungry growls and moans. Fight! Blood! Flee! Krista bit her lip to silence her instincts. She watched as Master Farnham stepped before them, a massive ceramic sword in his right hand. He leaned over his daughter, who sat in the dust and rubble of the road with her hands tied, and kissed her. He also sniffed Bo and nodded slightly before facing Darina. Law or not, you've no right invading our lands when the night has our blood up, he said. Couldn't wait. My body won't restrain the AI much longer. Master Farnham's fierce face melted and Krista scented fear rise from his body. Her father and the other villagers stepped away from the plague bird, while a few of the hunters fled into the darkness. Betrayal. Blood. Blood. Krista screamed as she realized what was about to happen. <coughs> she grabbed her crutch and smashed it across the plague bird's <coughs> face, knocking Darina to the ground. I won't do it. Krista yelled. I won't be like you. Darina nodded. Like I said, the choice is always yours. With that... Darina pulled a knife from its sheath and delicately cut her own throat. Blood spraying in a fire-tracing arch. Krista froze in shock as the blood AI embraced its red freedom. Even Blue's illumination dimmed before the blood, as if the village AI feared what was to come. Darina's head flopped dead to the broken ground, blank eyes staring at Krista. Krista knew she was being tricked, knew the game being played against her. But she also felt the rage rising from the blood AI as it licked its way around the hunters and villagers. She felt it caress Bo and the hunter girl, saw it judge the worth of her father and Master Farnham. Flee. No. Krista told herself. In a louder voice, she screamed, No, not them, me! The blood AI turned, tasting her body, testing her resolve to defy its power, but she again ordered it to take her. Reluctantly, the AI complied, flowing into her skin and mouth, feasting on her blood. Krista fell to the broken asphalt and rolled in pain as the AI bound itself to her, gene to gene, atom to atom, blood to blood. She saw 2,000 years of its judgments, saw every human and AI condemned by this entity of purest right and wrong. Desperate not to be overwhelmed, Krista fought back, aided by the wolf. She bit and tore into the AI, refusing to show throat, screaming that she was in charge, that there would be no judgments without her. Finally, they reached agreement. Wolf and girl and blood AI. Balance. A good balance. You'll do well, the blood AI whispered in her mind. You'll do well indeed. Krista woke to her father shaking her body repeating her name over and over. 
However, she heard him as if listening to someone talking far across the fields they plowed each year. As if she controlled her body like the harness and reins controlled Eggbeater. Krista stood up. The hunters and villagers stared with fear. Even Blue floated away from her. Krista stretched her lame leg, which moved without pain for the first time since the attack. She walked over to Darina and pulled the red vest and shirt and trousers off the dead woman's body and dressed in the forbidden colors. She strapped the twin knives to her thighs and pulled one knife free. In the polished sheen of the blade, she saw her face. A glowing red line ran from her right eye to lips. Her hair burned brightest red. She turned to Bo and the hunter girl. Ms. No. Poller cried and tried to stop Krista, no. but Master Farnham held the woman back. However, instead of killing either Bo or the girl, Krista simply cut their bonds. She pointed the knife at Bo. You will never return to the village, she said. You will live with Master Farnham's clan. Assuming Master Farnham has nothing to say against that and lets the villagers return home in peace. Master Farnham kneeled before Krista and thanked her. Thank you, Plaguebird. Joined by a grateful Ms. Poller. Bo and the hunter girl held hands and bowed. Bo looked at Krista with a mix of love and regret. But those emotions quickly fled as Krista allowed the blood AI to lick into him and <laughs> whisper that this was his final chance. The urine tang of fear scented Bo's body. Krista turned from Bo in disgust. It no longer mattered what he'd done to her, only what he did to others in the future. She looked at her father, whose tears streaked the dust in his beard. Right now, she couldn't handle speaking even a single word with her father. Perhaps soon, but not now. I don't want them seeing me, she thought. Instantly, the AI rumbled in her blood and reached out to the villagers and hunters. People glanced around nervously, trying to see where she'd gone. Only Blue still saw her. Krista looked at the AI and saw past its deceiving cloud of light, saw its consciousness extending into other dimensions and across time, saw its overriding dedication to returning humanity to what they'd once been. There was no choice. If you'd stayed, Bo would have killed you, and we'd have had to kill Bo. This way, you both live. The wolf growled. What right did Blue have to decide her fate like that? To calm Krista, the blood AI whispered a truth. In order for humanity to truly return to the way they'd been, AIs, like Blue, would have to cease being the protective gods of every village. When those days arrived, it would be as easy to kill Blue as for Krista's old body to crush an egg. Blue sensed the Blood AI's thoughts and shrank in fear from Krista. The Blood AI laughed. <laughs> I'll be keeping a close eye on the village, Krista told Blue. Don't disappoint me. With that, she walked down the trail, the night scents mingling to the Blood AI's whispers until she didn't care which part of her was human, or wolf, or hunt at all. And now, a word about today's story. One of the downsides to writing short stories is that an author can only visit so long with any particular world or character. After all, the nature of short stories requires that they must be, well, short. Unfortunately for me, I've fallen in love with both the world of Plague Birds and with the main character, Christina de Ain. So, while Plague Birds started out as a standalone story, it quickly demanded that no way in hell would I be able to tell the story in a single tale. I've already written a sequel to Plague Birds, which should be published this year. This new story follows Krista as she takes on the responsibilities and duties of a Plague Bird. I mean, if you think starting a new job is rough, try starting a new job with a know-it-all and extremely powerful entity living in your body. I've also started writing a third story in this sequence. Because the setup of Plague Birds has so much potential, I wouldn't be surprised if I eventually write an entire book of stories set in this world. OK, 
Okay, welcome back, folks. I hope you enjoyed that story. I'm still with you. Oh, that's good. I didn't think you were going to be able to raise your head back up off of the table. It's such soft wood. <laughs> uh, it is pine. Gosh, what was I going to say? Oh, hey, Brian helped us again on that. And I, if I had to guess, I'd say Brian has produced more episodes of the show than anyone any guest producer. Yeah, he, he started way back when we asked for producers probably the first time and uh, has continued to produce episodes for us. As soon as he's finished with one, he's ready to start on the next one. He asks me to uh, send him out a story and he does a great job. I, I'm always impressed with the stuff that he puts together. And each time it seems like he tops himself. It's like... Uh, Pixar or something, each time they make a film, it's like they're doing their best to top what they did in the one before. It's really cool to see that happen. You know why I love Brian? Why? The episode that made everybody hate us, he thought was funny. <laughs> That's something that I will remember uh, until the day I die, which is probably which, five, yeah. ten minutes from now. Maybe as soon as you get in your car and start trying to drive home... And then you puke all over the windshield. <laughs> hey, okay, if you don't want to hear puke talk, skip ahead one minute. But but we'll, let's just take this moment. And and you know what? Maybe we'll just save it for Wendy. But uh, you know what? I'm in my 30s. I'm a grown-up, ostensibly. And I have yet to get over this childlike <laughs> stubbornness when it comes to throwing up. I'll feel sick and I'll be miserable and I'll just lay there and wallow in it when all I would have to do is go and, and, and throw up and it would all be over. Yes. I know from experience, from life, that the second <laughs> I throw up, I'm going to feel better. Uh, like like magic, like expecto patronum, <laughs> expecto rate patronum. And <laughs> yet I won't do it. I prefer to lay there. I'll lay there for like 15 minutes going, yeah, I, I pray it, to Shiva, fly. let oh, me die. But I do not. And you'll sit there. It's like you, you, you breathe slow. You do everything you can to keep it from coming up. And there's just something is so unpleasant about throwing up. I don't know if everybody's that way. Maybe some people throw up so often that they just, yeah, well, I just do that because I like it. There may be some people out there that it's the only way they can get an erection. But with me, I finally stumbled out into the snow in your front, uh, the side of your house. I didn't want to go in the front because, you know, the mailman. But Always rings those... twice for some reason. Oh. Hmm. Really? <laughs> yeah, because apparently that's code for something. Oh, crap. The worst thing was just this. And yeah, I'm sorry. It's been longer than a minute. So maybe we'll put it in the outtakes. <laughs> my jaw, like, it, it hurt because it was just like my body couldn't expel stuff fast enough. Mm. So it had to just like, no, open up wider, wider. And I was still like, oh, no. I'm going to like dislocate my jaw or something. <laughs> then, you know, after my stomach was empty, it still felt like it needed to do it three more times after that. And uh, should we tell vomit stories for this episode? This could be really good. I mean, this may preclude Jason from ever sending us another story, but <laughs> aren't vomit stories some of the funnest to tell? Is this really what you guys want to be talking about tonight? Well, gotta love telling those stories. We, we need to call up Brian because he's our only friend. And ask him, okay, uh, we're considering talking about <laughs> vomiting. Do we cut it out? Do we put it at the end? Or do we just go ahead and say, we're just not going to talk about the story. We're going to talk about throwing up. <laughs> there was this time. The funny thing, though, you know, like you said, you, you know that you're going to feel better once you're done. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you're just sick. You throw up. And then when you're done, you have like, 20 minutes off maybe and then you throw up some more and then maybe you get a few more minutes off i've had some times like that one time i was in my car trying to get home from work when the uh vomit hit and i threw up all over my car and then i got home and i was like oh, crap i'm gonna have to you've got to clean that clean up clean all that up and i came mm -hmm. inside and then i just threw up again and again and again and i was like screw it you realized um, you had kids and that's what they're for i'm not cleaning that up and that was the worst decision of my life really i needed to get that cleaned up because the next morning it's not okay especially in a car 
kingdom yeah. of flies. Yeah there's, yeah, there's so many little places for things like that to get wedged inside of a car. It was the worst idea I ever had. Never wait till later. It doesn't matter how sick you are. You get out there and you clean it up. <laughs> do, 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 do. Okay, so back to the uh, story. The uh, oh, worst vomiting experience for me ever was... I can't take it again. Uh, Good night, everybody. I was in a, a strange place where it was surrounded by people I didn't know. And I was so, so sick. I was at a bus station. It was one of those things where I was so sick that I had no sense of germs or decorum or whatever. You put your forehead against the toilet seat of a bus station toilet <laughs> kind of thing. And anyhow, I, I threw up and oh, it wasn't just throw up either. It was, it was coming out both ends almost <laughs> at the identical time. And then I, I looked on the rack and there was no toilet paper. It was just empty. And the men's room attendant he was you know he was just outside the oh it was like the, the probably the lowest point of my entire life and i begged this man to give me toilet paper and he wanted to sell it to me he wanted me to pay him for the toilet paper i don't want to get into any religious topic but if there is a hell this man who tried to sell me toilet paper underneath the stall, he's going to be there. <laughs> and maybe I'll greet him with a, a hug and we'll laugh about it. But it was so sad. And then to beg, to have to beg after this awful, humiliating, really dirty experience. I don't know. It's one of those things. If you could die of shame, that probably would be applicable. Uh, and you? I never had to beg for toilet paper. I'll have to admit. I don't know if I could pick which one would be my worst. I'd have to put some thought into that. Well, the car the thing is, is... Covering the car with the puke was pretty bad because I have to drive that car to work every day. It was probably more than a month before it ever stopped smelling. Oh, no. It was really, really bad. It was all over. And it was in the air conditioning vents. And I tried to scrape it out of there. It would not. It was so, so foul. No amount of Febreze could get rid of the stench for some reason. <laughs> You had to total the car. There was no <laughs> other recourse, but you just drove it to an impound lot and said, you got one of those big crushing things? <laughs> it was just so bad. It took so long for it to go away. And I've had some pretty good vomit experiences over the years. But yeah, that, that was probably one of the worst. I, I think I mentioned on the show once a long time ago about the time when I was on a bus that uh, somebody had thrown up on the floor of the bus. And we were all sitting there going, oh, Jesus, you can't go anywhere. You're on the bus. There's no way to get away. you got to get to your stop before you can. And then somebody else sitting next to the throw up threw up out the window of the bus. And I was like, holy crap, i got to get out of here before we freaking float down a river of puke. Uh, it was pretty bad. Yeah, I've had some of those experiences where I, it must be like food poisoning or something like that that causes you to be so bad that you're throwing up and crap in your pants at the same time. And yeah, there was a time when I was so, so sick that I was just friggin' delirious as I got up all night long to puke and then crap and then puke. And then, you know, it was like standing up, turning around, standing up, turning. You just kept up and oh, it was bad times. I guess that's just some of the joys of living. I suppose. <laughs> we, uh, I went to see this film uh, with John Lovitz. Uh, I wasn't with John Lovitz. But he was in the film. It was called High School High. And it was really bad. But I've always loved John Lovitz, so I figured I'd give it a chance. And I don't know, about a third of the way through the movie, I guess a bunch of frat guys snuck in and they sat at the very very back row back center and you could hear like their bottles clinking and i guess they were just binge drinking for fun but uh at one point you could hear the <laughs> noise in the back and then this strange phenomenon occurred where people started screaming 
and jumping up and in the middle of the movie. And I guess what had happened is he'd vomited this ton. <laughs> and the way that a theater is built is the floor is stadium in, seating in a decline. And it just started to run and people were sitting there and this river would run <laughs> to their feet and they would shriek and jump up and move. And I have no idea if uh, High School High was that bad a movie or if it was just the experience. But yeah, it's not something I ever felt like revisiting. I think the real question is, what do we do with all this conversation? I don't know. I know that you've told that frat guys in the back of the uh, theater story once before on the show because I remember pretending that I was the guy in the back and saying, oh yeah, sorry about that, man. Oh, <laughs> you're right. Shoot, I'm sorry, and man. I know that I've told the bus vomit story before too. So Look, the fact that we told those stories on the show before means that we, I guess, weren't afraid to talk about vomit at a different time. So I guess not. That's interesting. We can move on from vomit from here, I guess. But oh, here's the thing. Let's say that we get on Facebook and I ask a question in a public forum of, well, should this be cut out? Should it be put in the outtakes? Should it be put at the end of the episode? Should it be leave, left in? I imagine that the people who don't want to hear it even if they are outweighed by the people that are like, oh, everything you do is fun, they'll really not want to hear it. <laughs> and so should I even bother asking what people think? Yeah, I don't think it really matters. We just put out our show. Okay. It's topical because you just finished throwing up. All right, so let's end all the throwing up conversation now, unless... Now? Wait, you really want to quit now? You know, we could make a game of it. The squinting and groaning makes me think... <laughs> Well, we could see if you could say something disgusting enough <laughs> to get me over the edge. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> Welcome to Make Rich Throw Up, the game show that people are gagging over. The Plague Bird story was, it was long. Yeah, it finishes up at 52.32, so it's pretty long. Okay, so it's almost an hour. But this was another one of those really arduous reads. Uh, <laughs> not so much for you, I think, as for me. I, I wasn't sick. I just I couldn't stay awake. And, and you were reading it, and it took us a long time. And Was it because it was late at night? or Yeah, I was think this... that's generally uh, the problem that we have when we have a really hard time with a story is you combine two things. A, we're recording it at the very, very end of a long night usually, so it's 1.30 or so when we start, and then it turns out to be a really long story. So you put the late at night along with a long story, and by the time we're done... I can tell a lot of times when I'm editing and I'm like, oh, I'm starting to sound tired here. I think I'm running out of gas. I wonder if I'll make it to the end. Gosh, there's got to be some solution to that, and I don't know what it is. More caffeine? Because you were, and then you have children. And we've found that trying to record when the kids are up is not possible. Or, well, it may be possible, but it's just not practical. Not a good possible. idea. Too noisy. And too many interruptions. Not only are they noisy outside the door, but then they keep coming in and saying, Hey, I just wanted to come in here and say hi and stand here and talk to you and until you kick them. That's always the best method I've found with kids. I learned that from Dr. Spock. Not Mr. Spock, Dr. Spock. Yeah, different. you lost me with Dr. <laughs> well, see, we used to have a room where we recorded, a room with the door. Yes. And we no longer do. We're back to where we first started the <laughs> podcast, right. which is your dinner table. Uh, and you know, I wonder if it sounds different, if the show's different sounding than it was. Yeah, it's got a lot more echoey bouncing around sound, I bet, because of that. There's not much that we can do right now. Your son is living in the room where we were recording, and you will someday, I guess, have a den or an office or that something. That is the plan. And, and we can record there if that happens, but, you know, it's just practicality. Uh, but, yeah, we have to start after the kids go to bed. But we can't go too late because i got to get up in the morning and go to work. We usually go we too late too, anyway. We do go too anyway. late, but... There's a certain cutoff point that uh, usually we don't even record as late as we're recording now. Right, because of the, the tiredness, the fatigue, and also because my verbal barometer tends to go completely nuts after a certain hour, and I start to think jokes that are wildly inappropriate would be appropriate. <laughs> and Brian is the only one who apparently appreciates those jokes. So right now it's what, 2.20 in the morning? 20. And we haven't even started talking about the damn plague birds. Okay, here we go. Post-apocalyptic story. Yes. 
We haven't done a lot of those. I love post-apocalyptic. I do too. Oh, this is much better. It seems like as a filmmaker, that's the easy way to go because you can go to a junkyard. You can go to Detroit. You can just – everybody knows of a neighborhood that's run down or an area where everything is wrecked and all that. And, and you can uh, – you're not going to throw up on the mic, are you? No, I will make oh. it outside if I have to. That was a lot of swallowing. You were making me nervous there. <laughs> and and sometimes you don't even have to explain in, in a story or a movie what happened. It's just like, you know what? This is post-apocalyptic. You want to fill in the gaps? That's cool, but we won't let you know what happened. Like, ugh, we go to this all the time. Uh, it used to be a rule that we had to go to this all the time. Yeah. Uh, in the Firefly world, we talked about that. Earth that was. Yeah, and they just what, say. What happened to they it? They have that little prologue that they would put at the start of each episode where it was like the world was used up or something like that. That's all they really say. It was used up. So we had to go elsewhere. Good. Like, Firefly, I thought you'd forgotten to mention it this week. Isn't it the road where they just, something happened? You never know what it was. Everybody's dead. Yeah. And just the idea of apocalypse, you know. When I was a kid, I think the first post-apocalyptic story that I read was Alas, Babylon. We read that in my 10th grade class, and that was a nuclear holocaust. But wasn't that telling the story of how it happened, or was it all aftermath? It was mostly aftermath, mostly post-apocalyptic. There was the opening scene or so that was before it happened, and then it all happened, and then it was these people surviving from then on. And uh, not too long after that, I read The Stand by Stephen King, which is a totally different kind of apocalypse. You get pre-apocalypse and post-apocalypse in that giant book. <laughs> yes, you do. There's something in interesting about doing that kind of an apocalypse because with your nuclear apocalypse, things have to be destroyed. You can't have a big empty city that's still just sitting there with cans of food on the shelf that just need to be eaten by somebody in a nuclear holocaust all those things are blown to pieces and only if you're out in the middle of nowhere do you survive whereas the stand kind of an apocalypse where everybody just gets sick and dies you know the whole world is left for the people who didn't get sick and that's a similar kind of like the zombie apocalypse that we see so often these days is really interesting because you have the same kind of a thing except for now the apocalypse doesn't go away the zombies are still out there hunting you. You're not just immune to the apocalypse like you are with the stand. You're just the lucky person that hasn't been eaten yet. You know, you always have that, oh, it's it's waiting around the corner to get me kind of a thing, which I've always uh, enjoyed about that. This apocalypse that we have here in this story is completely different than anything that that uh, I've mentioned so far, where it's... the One of the things that is maintained in almost all of the post-apocalyptic stories is that technology is gone. Right. That you're back to a simpler time. And in in this case, you've got that, but you've also got the, you know, a Matrix, a Terminator kind of apocalypse where there are, is technology beyond what we have today still going around. Right. Um, technology somehow becomes so advanced that it's self-replicating and no longer needs people to uh, keep it going. It just does it itself, which is uh, something different than, than those kind of apocalypses where, yeah, I mean, you don't have people around. How are you going to make an iPad? You know, even the guy who invented the thing probably couldn't do it without somebody else making all the pieces for them. Our society these days is so interconnected here and there and everywhere that nothing stands on its own. Pull the rug out from under it and, yeah, it's just all going to fall down. Have you ever written a story? Set in a post-apocalyptic universe. Yeah, a few. That's one of my favorite things, you know, from early on. Like maybe from reading The Last Babylon, one of the first big ideas that I ever came up with way back when I was still in high school was all post-apocalyptic. After the nuclear bombs had fallen and destroyed the world and all the people had to live in underground cities and then there was people up above that were mutated mutated and they were able to survive on the ground whereas the regular humans were all hiding out in technological caves underworld i've written a couple stories set in that whole world but not a great deal my october scary story from last year was set in that universe wow do you come up with the story that you want to tell and then create the world or do you come up with the world first 
because in this one, the world is really interesting and intricate and thought out, but it's not really dwelt on all that much. It's mostly the narrative of what happens to the characters. Right. And it makes me wonder, well, maybe he came up with this idea and he's like, well, okay, what kind of story can I come up with set in this world? Or maybe that there's more than one story in the Plague Birds universe. I don't know. Maybe originally this was a uh, period story, you know, set in, in the uh -huh. Dark Ages. And he realized that instead of magic, it needed to be technology. And for it to be technology, it had to be in the future. And I, I don't know. That's a good question. But I think that there's never necessarily a perfect answer for that. You know, it doesn't always go one way or another. For example, the one that I was just talking about. I still have very few stories set in that universe. For as detailed as I've come up with the universe in my mind, I haven't come up with a good story to tell in the universe, unfortunately. So in that case, the universe was created, and then you have to come up with a story to go in it. And I think other times you come up with a story, and then you think, okay, for this story to work, what does it need to be? There's lots of different ways to... Uh, go about it and i think that's the way it is for any story you know you, you come up with something whatever the germ may be for your story then you have to build the rest of it around it and sometimes the germ is the setting sometimes the germ is the character sometimes the germ is the plot but eventually the germ will cause a super flu that kills everyone off and causes an apocalypse that's all that matters what the crap I hear you. <laughs> uh, another thing that I believe we mentioned the last time we got one of Jason's stories is that uh, it's so different than the other stories that he'd sent us, uh, you know, as far as genre goes, as far as just the feel of the story. You know, he had that down home maps of the Bible story, uh -huh. you know, the American South. And right, right. He had Free Langa or Lanja or Lajunga. Uh, sci-fi futuristic I mean, my multiple world colonization story and then he had whatever the hell the first story was that he sent thorns as tips of trees are you talking uh oh that's right. booksellers of the galactic rim Ooh, i'd forgotten about booksellers of the galactic rim i was thinking of thorns of the tips of okay. trees but we didn't do that here on the show no we didn't it was actually here. Uh, you know if you're a new listener and you really like jason's stuff do yourself a favor and go to starship sofa and just do a search on jason sanford or uh, the, the story when thorns are the tips of trees Geez, one of the best stories I've ever had the honor of reading. Mm -hmm. We were able to read that for uh, Starship Sofa, and that's, it's gosh, it's been... More than two years. Now. Yeah, a long time since uh, we did that, and uh, that was a, a good experience, and it established our relationship with uh, Jason Sanford. And Jason Sanford uh, sends us a story along each time. He sent us a story along this time. And didn't even realize that <laughs> he'd already told Starship Sofa that they could do it. So he sent us another story along, Plague Birds, which we just did. Each time, he, he definitely doesn't just do the same old story again and again, which is really cool. You get a completely, totally reimagined. We all, like we mentioned, we did Maps of the Bible. We also did Book, book Sellers, Scouts, book of, Scouts the, of the Galactic Rim, rim, rim. which <laughs> was a completely different story, again, set in present about a guy who travels around and finds rare books to sell. Then there was also the story that we had uh, the opportunity to be uh, to play a part in. It was actually Lizanne Hurd who did the story. I think she did it for Starship Sofa. It was Ships Like Clouds Risen by Their Rain, which is another story that Jason Sanford did that we did a couple voices on. I think it actually may have only been you. So, wow, that, this is more than just a handful of stories. That and that story is, again, another completely different story it's set on a different world different and unusual when you compare it to everything else that uh, we've got so that's one good thing that you can count on from jason sanford you're not going to get the same old thing yeah i gotta admit i've written the same story about 15 times yeah um i'm a regular dean Kuntz when it comes to that <laughs> you know I, I i have a couple of ideas that I just really, really like. And uh -huh. I come up with twists on that idea. Or, or what if this same thing happened to a couple of Girl Scouts and things like that? And so that's definitely a weakness in my writing that Jason doesn't seem to have. It definitely takes a, a lot of effort. I don't know how long he thinks about a story. 
before he actually sits down and writes it. We're doing this 25 stories in 52 weeks challenge thing, and I've been uh, getting ready for that. I've been reading a lot of the books that I have on writing and stuff like that recently, just trying to prepare myself for this upcoming year. And uh, yeah, one of the things that a lot of them talk about is just sitting back and uh, letting your mind wander, letting it come up with the ideas. And then when you see your idea and you think, okay, how can I twist it? What can I do different? What can I make it totally unusual from the 15 stories that I've already written that are exactly like it kind of a thing. And we've talked about Dean Wesley Smith saying that writing is, is not hard work because you're not sweating in the sun digging a ditch or something like that. But it is work. It's not grueling, back-breaking kind of work, but it takes a lot of thought. It's mind-breaking work. Yeah, mind-breaking work. It takes a lot of thought to come up with a really good story and to tell something different than everybody else has already told a hundred times over. You know, these days, hundreds of books come out. Every week, there's more and more books coming out. And so for yours to stand out, it has to be something more. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of thought. And uh, that's something that I'm, I'm trying to work on this time around is putting more thought into the story before I start writing it so that I can write it quickly because I know what's supposed to go in there and uh, I can finish it maybe that way too, which is always good. I have a tendency to not necessarily finish everything that I start. Now, is that just you? I don't Because I so. certainly don't finish everything that I start, but let's say that you're a writer of Jason's caliber and a professional writer. Does he have hundreds of incomplete stories out there like I do? I suppose it's possible. I don't know. I would think, and I guess Jason could maybe uh, comment if he wants to on what his process is like, but I would think that he would spend the time to prepare the story before he actually puts the pen to the paper and starts the writing, gets it worked out enough in his mind. Perhaps he just does it thinking it out. Perhaps he sits down and writes it scene by scene how he wants it to go so that he knows where to go with it. And he knows that it's going to get to where he wants it to go. See, that's where I've had problems is I haven't prepared ahead of time enough. And I start writing and I get well into the story and suddenly I realize oh, this isn't working. It's not good the way it is. It's supposed to be like this, but it's like this instead. That's usually where I bail and then spend six to eight months doing nothing. Wow, that's depressing, dude. <laughs> but 2011 is not like that. It's not. 2011 I've... is the year we make contact. I'm sorry. No, that was last year. The 2011 <laughs> is the year that you break free of them chains that bind you and yeah. write 25 stories and... Uh, or more. Or, we'll see or how more. it goes. You know, something that I mentioned to you before the vomiting was, oh, you know, one of those stories needs to be you and me doing a collaboration. The thing that we've talked about for years. I think that there's definitely room for that. Maybe we can even make a promise right now to the folks on the show. If we do a collaboration story, we will podcast it. Oh, geez. Really? On the oh, air. Although it would be interesting to talk about it afterward because... I have so few positive collaborative experiences <laughs> and to say, okay, well, this was difficult or this worked really well, or you came up with this and I was dead set against it and turned out that I was wrong. To me, that's really interesting. Uh, I always want to ask people that collaborate, how, mm -hmm. how, how do you manage? do it? And so, wait, so have you made some kind of promise to our listener? Well, I said that we'd podcast the story if we write it, which doesn't mean a whole lot. <laughs> when it comes down to it, that was always our plan anyway, so I didn't promise anything unexpected. Well, you and I had an idea for a story, and it was basically one year I came here from L.A. to visit you on, like, Christmas Eve Eve, or, or maybe it was Christmas Eve, I don't know, and... I drove out to your house. It was the first time I'd ever seen your house, and there was this giant snowstorm. Yeah. And the people on the television were saying, make sure that you have your will in a place where it can be found. Uh, no, they were saying, do not go out if you can help it. Only on the most dire need should you drive or go out in this weather. 
And so I think you guys said, well, why don't you just sleep on the couch and maybe tomorrow everything will be better and we'll dig out your car and you can go to your parents' place. And, and I didn't do it. Uh, you know, I was just too proud or maybe it was Christmas Eve and I wanted to be with my family. I don't know. <laughs> But your will was, you, you knew it was in a place that could be found easily. So you, you risked it. But, the, you know, I always had the idea of that, of being snowbound. That seemed like a good setting for a story. But what kind of story? And we sort of bandied around a couple of ideas in that. And I liked the idea of you and me being estranged and not getting along. And then I'm forced to stay with you despite that, you know, where it was just going to be in and out and Merry Christmas and then go away. And then suddenly I'm stuck here. And I was like, well, what could stick us there? Uh, okay. A snowstorm. Well, what happens once the snowstorm comes? And, and I don't know, I think that was intended to be our Christmas 2010 <laughs> episode. Yeah. I think that was what we were hoping for. And it never got off the ground, but maybe we should sit down and talk about it sometime and say, Hey, let's let that be one of our 25 stories. I like that idea. Plus, I've spelled out a lot of it right here on the air. You know, maybe people will be like, hey, whatever happened to that story? Hey, I thought you guys were, hey, Christmas is coming oh, yeah. up. Where is that story kind of thing? And I like that. I like the cattle prod in the arse. Who wants the prod? Me, 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 me. I want, I want, I want. That, uh, having somebody say, hey, come on, man. You said you were going to do this. I'm holding you to it. That, that, that provides. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I definitely agree with you. That's always helped me to uh, actually achieve things, to accomplish goals, is to have the cattle prod in the arse. I love you guys. <laughs> as you so bluntly, deliciously, brutally, as you so eloquently put it. When we're recording this, it's just the start of the new year. I'm sure by the time you hear it, it's somewhere near the end of the new year but <laughs> the end of the mayan calendar folks but you know we've got the new goals of what we're doing this year and so far so good i've written on my lunch today. hour i did write today i'm working on the planning stages of the new story that i uh it's actually an idea that i'd never considered making a story out of it but just within the last week or so i thought you know what that could make a really good story i'll have to figure out how to do that and that's what i'm doing now and I'm looking forward to having it written. That's soon. good. You know, Lizanne, speaking of her a long time ago, she set up this Facebook page that we mentioned a few episodes back. Mm -hmm. It's a Facebook group and it's called the 25 Story 52 Week. What is it called? 52 25 Challenge or 25 52 Challenge or okay. something. So just like do a that. search on that if you'd like to join the group. I mean, it's still early enough in the year that it's just a, an excuse for a bunch of writers to get together and try and intimidate one another. No, to <laughs> try and encourage one, one up oh encourage sorry i was gonna help you out there well but I guess that not. seems to be what's gone <laughs> on so far he's like i wrote a story that makes rish's new story look like an undulating pile of crap and i'm like who are you marshall latham and <laughs> it, 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 so that has been the case but at the same time i wrote 300 words today and somebody likes your comment and somebody else says you go girl and it helps oh, you strangely they're saying that to you well, that's that's all right you reap what you sow i don't really know because it's early enough what what has going on with this whole 52 weeks 25 stories challenge but it's not too late to join up and just share stuff. And I believe we've got a blog. There may be a podcast that has something to do with it. And, you know, that, that might not be for you. But if you're a writer, write. And if you've written, share it with somebody. Submit it. Sell it. And if you've sold it, write another story. Yeah. you got to live your dream. This is something that I learned from when my wife made me watch Flashdance the other night. If you don't live your dream, you die. And she's a maniac, yeah, that maniac too. on the floor. She's dancing like she never danced before. You guys are the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. Oh, fo folks, Valentine's Day is uh, right around the corner. Oh, dude, I was finally feeling a little better. I hear you. And sorry, but it is. And I understand that Valentine's Day is not your favorite holiday. That's why we're going to do a special segment on the show to help those who ain't got a little more. 
Did you just quote Bruce Hornsby in the... I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, what I've done is I've got a genuine woman on the line here volunteering to see if we can get you a leg up in the relationship department. Is this all an elaborate and overwritten practical joke, Big? Uh, no. It's a segment we like to call Hilton Helps the Hopeless. <gasps> Paris Hilton? Uh, Rish, you're such an idiot. Fellow podcaster and friend of the show, Abigail Hilton, is here. Hello. To uh, advise Rish in the area of romance. Hello. Thanks for being on the show. <laughs> no problem. My awkward conversations quota for the year has not yet been met. Luckily, we uh, caught you early, huh? You have no idea. That's usually uh, Rish's line. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I I'm feeling out of the loop. What's going on with this? I'm here to give you a little practice with the opposite sex. In a safe environment, a role-playing kind of thing. Uh, do you mind being the elf? You know, I, I have a thing for elf maidens. Uh, uh, we all do, Rish. Uh, but this is to help you out in the real world. Who knows? Maybe our listeners will get something out of it, too. All right. You ready? Ready. Me, too. I guess. So, Rish, uh, you meet Abby at, say, the grocery store. Approach her. Uh, hello, Abby. How's it going? Do I know you? Apparently. Do you, um, want to go out sometime? Whoa, whoa, that's way too quick. I've heard that a lot. <laughs> no. I mean you're being too direct. Especially if we just ran into each other. It gives off a creepy stalker vibe. Uh, I hear that a lot, too. Hmm. Okay, uh, so, so how is your job treating you? Nobody died today. It was awesome. Well, I... I know what you're tempted to say here, Rish. Don't do it. Okay, sorry. So, uh, you're a doctor, right? That's my favorite game. No, no, that's still too forward. Come on, you've got to be patient and relaxed. You're starting to come across as desperate. You have no idea. There you go, told you. Desperation is really unattractive. This is like an interview. She's evaluating you, but you're also evaluating her. She's not an alien species, Rish. She's just a person. Relax. It's hard to be relaxed when there's the possibility of sex in the air. Believe me, Rish, there isn't. That's all right. I'm ambidextrous. Big, this isn't working. Keep trying, Abby. We don't call this helping the hopeless for nothing. I'm sorry. I use humor as a way to charm women. And how has that worked for you so far? Not well. G give Rish some advice. Tell him how to break the ice. If you know this hypothetical girl, talk about a common interest. If she's a stranger, give her a compliment. Something not directly sexual. Uh, all right. Or indirectly, come to think of it. Um, okay. Let the girl know you're happy to see her. Like it made your day to run into her. Hey, Abby. Fancy meeting you here. Guess that deal with the devil finally paid off. Be serious. Okay. Hey, Abby. It, it sure is cool to find you here. But we shop at the same store all this time, and I never saw you here before. I come here all the time. Tuesday nights, mostly. Well, they have the, the best microwave burritos. You know, sometimes they're on sale, so I buy more. Why don't you compliment her, Rish? You, you have fine taste in grocery stores, Abby. Damn fine taste. I think he means compliment my clothes or appearance. Oh, sure. I, I like your clothes. And your appearance is nice. Nice? Just nice? Your appearance is... Stunning? Impressive? Really nice? Are you a robot? Try to do it more naturally. Okay, uh, okay, I've got it. Gee, Abby, your hair really looks great today. Thanks, Rish. <laughs> New dandruff shampoo? Oh, good God. I mean, you wouldn't need it. Your hair's fine. You know, I wish mine was as flake-free as yours is. Big, I've got to go. My dog needs to be taken for his walk. No, wait. He's just we about can to do this. Him. Sorry. Bye. Okay, well, that was uh, Hilton Helps the Hopeless for today. 
uh, do you think her hanging up on me uh, is indicative of how I was doing? She, yeah, she uh, ran out of time. She had to take her dog to the walk. Wait a minute. She's a cat person. So pathetic it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. Uh, I guess this has been a very rambling conversation. <laughs> oh, they all are. Yeah, but, what else is new? But it's late. I'm ill. Thank you, Jason, for sending us yet another story. They've all been good. Yeah. And I guess I can't say that about my own stories, but <laughs> I, you know, I. But they're all the same, at least, your stories. <laughs> all the same? <laughs> Dean Koontz has Watchers, and he has Twilight Eyes, and those aren't the same book. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you also to Brian Lincoln. He's got a podcast of his own that is also for people who are doing full cast audio, and he has shared his experiences in editing stories for us and producing stories for us on that podcast, and it's well worth a listen. He often has guests. Uh, but more important than all of that shit is that he's a good guy. And, you know, we need more of those, too. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm awfully sick. I'm sorry. You're not going to make it any further. Okay. To avoid the puke spatters on my kitchen floor, we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Big Anquovich. Yeah, and I'm Rich Outfield. Ooh, good night. See ya. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. If you're ever in a generous mood, we'd love it if you donated. Good night, folks. Take two. It was actually Liz... Lizanne Hurd, who did the story, I think she did it for Starship Sofa. It was Here We... No, that's the other Here one. Here we are, born to be kings. We have a print... Now, now your, your line is, now I'm going to be sick. Princes of the universe. Okay, now I'm going to be sick. There, I said my line. Are you guys singing again? Krista pulled a carrot from her pocket and fed it to Eggbird. Eggbird, the plague bird. Last year, at her 18th birthday party, the village's artificial intelligence had manipulated Krista's senses in a game of hide the kiss. Hide the salami. <laughs> that came out like crap, didn't it? Duty. Duty. I like duty. Oh, there's our static. What was W's duty? Duty can be a hard thing. <laughs> uh, I like duty. Duty. D duty. Do her duty. She wanted the plague bird to leave. I lost my place. Vaginosis. What the? She wanted. Where in the hell are Keep we? Keep going. Right, there you go. An interest we can do. It doesn't sound like I'm saying anything sense. Not sense. It's hard to make a difference between those two words. Huh? And just say skints. <laughs> People okay. understand. Perfect. Darina said. I like that in a man. I'll be visiting him later when you look to the window next door and it's a rockin' don't come a knockin'. Uh. Uh. Leave my sight! <laughs> Sorry. I'll stop burping, Master Farnham. <clears throat> oh, I jumped down a lot. Oh, that's the light. Oh, you're right. No, he didn't. Angry animals. Anima? Animal. Freaking, and I want. And I need. And I love. Animal. Animal. Come on, Steve. Bayo. Maybe you should have been Bayo. 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 Was I Bayo or were you? I don't even remember. Did we ever give him a voice? She cursed humanity for playing genetic god so long ago, resulting in people so warm and human one moment, all animal and anger the next. I totally blame Abby Hilton. Yeah. She's she's a scientist for creating and the she's got all sorts of animal human hybrid ideas. I think yeah, it's, it's probably was her. 
She smelled the barest touch of last night's sex on Bo. Now I want to say Bayo. I should have never said that. They are staying out of my sensing range, and the plague bird is sleeping, restraining her AI drained Darina's body more than I realized. Krista gazed at Blue. Maybe I should just call him Data. Krista gazed at Data's haze. <laughs> hey, Gary. <Dave. laughs> that fly didn't die. I just saw it coming again. Damn, I need a, a plague bird to kill the fly for me. He's guilty of bothering them while they try to read. Everyone's guilty, and that fly should end up dying. You must also go, Data said in her mind. Oh, so, oh sorry. Blue said in her mind. You doing all sorry. right over there? It's just gotten really hard to sit. <laughs> and I have to lean forward to read, too, so it's just... Yeah. Finally getting close, though. <laughs> Page 34? It's 54. 54, Regina Botgley. <laughs> well, it's not really 54. We did make the font 24 point, you know. Fight, blood, flee. It sounded like Batman there. Who are you working for? Fear me. <laughs> Master Farnham's fierce face. Fierce face. Farted. Master Farnham's fierce face. Farnum's fierce face. Flee! <laughs> the wolf has become Batman. <laughs> Fear me! Swear to me! That's what it was, yeah. That sound very Data-esque. I don't know. I'm sure he'll do something fun to it, and if he doesn't, then I will. But <laughs> Make it sound like a computer-type thing. We'll make it sound like Soundwave. You'll do well. That could work. Megatron is a giant queen. No, he's he a isn't. Bull queer. Hey, stop it. You take that back. <laughs> I love Megatron. The urine tang of fear scented Bo's body. Urine tang. That's the least <laughs> popular flavor of that astronaut drink. It is less popular than orange tang, but some people like it, amazingly enough. Hunt? I'm not sure what that means, but... Hunter? Until she didn't care which part of her was human or wolf or hunt at all. Or hunter at all. Or Huntington at all. Or... Bunt. Hunt's ketchup at all. Catsup. End. Ooh, wow. 2.53 a.m. Oh, bye. Oh, bye. You are a douchebag. <laughs> now that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, this is George Sulute Gay signing off. Don't be silly, Adrian Peterson. <laughs> All right, we are rolling. I liked your link, by the way, to the Adrian Peterson getting the woman fired for letting her pee in the toilet. <laughs> That was pretty funny. I wonder, I mean, like, if there's anybody that's safe to let in, it's somebody that everybody in the world knows who is. Because <laughs> you can't just come in and do something awful. The second, you know, they see you through the glass, they already know your name. Well, you're a fan of Adrian Peterson, right? Yeah. So is he the kind of guy who, when he heard that this woman got fired, would have said something at like a press conference or something? It's like, hey, I want to thank this woman who helped me. And she lost her job over that. And I, that was not cool and all that stuff. Or, or is he a guy who's just like, <clears throat> I would think that anyone would. Do, I mean, I, I guess there are some complete douchebags that wouldn't. But I think pretty much everybody that's not a complete. And I don't think he's a complete douchebag. It's not like I, you know, you don't really know somebody. I mean, I see him run, score touchdowns and stuff. But unless they do something really awful. Okay, well. But, you don't really hear about what they're like. He seems well, like he's a nice guy. Kobe Bryant, uh -huh. a fantastic athlete. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Douchebag? From what I've heard. Okay. Well, I see. I, so I, I think you can just tell on some people. I think Kobe Bryant has learned to become a little bit less of a douchebag. I think when he got brought up on those rape charges a few years ago, that kind of, uh, I mean, he got off. Uh, he beat the charges. 
Uh, Doesn't at all eat meat, ladies. Uh, anyways, he, yeah, he he didn't get convicted. He was not convicted, but right. uh, I think that scare helped him to uh, become a little bit less of a douchebag. Okay. Learned a thing or two. I think he had to shell out way too much money to keep his wife <laughs> buying her diamond well, rings. She was and, a handsome woman. But, she is, uh, yeah. I remember that, you know, just her standing up there and... And you could tell, oh, she didn't want to be there. She didn't want to be standing Who next would, to him. though? I always feel so bad for anybody like that where there's some douchebag, like some governor of South Carolina or whoever is up there giving their press conference talking about how they cheated on their wife and their wife is standing right there next to him like, oh, yes, I support you all the way. And you know they don't. There was this sketch on uh, Little Britain that they did a couple of times where like some member of parliament would stand up there with his wife and his hat he'd have his two children in front of him and he's doing a press conference and he's like there have been some disturbing allegations which i wish to address right now what happened was i needed to stop at a public restroom and and i went inside and to my astonishment there was already a man inside the toilet stall but uh, uh the floor was wet and as I turned around to exit the stall, because I realized there was someone there, I slipped on the wet pavement and fell upon this man. And uh, my, I was already in the process of, of distrousering, and uh, a part of him went inside a part of me. And it was a perfectly reasonable un- mistake, a misunderstanding. <laughs> the press is taken. Uh, a journalist happened to be walking by with a camera, and, uh, but it was it was it was an honest mistake an accident could have happened to anyone my wife and my children support me wholeheartedly in this and they'll just like look around just like oh geez can this be over soon yeah i just feel bad for those kind of people that are stuck with the philanderer Uh, um dennis rodman Uh, i'm pretty sure he's pretty well known for being kind of a douchebag Adrian Peterson I don't know him but he yeah. struck me as as a decent kind of guy. I I don't know how you can judge these things but right. People especially black people. I didn't say that. Especially athletes tend to uh they don't mince words or anything like that. You right. know what I mean? They're just like, "Hey, I don't have to pretend to be a nice guy if I'm not a nice." You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there are and some that so are like that. For a guy like Adrian Peterson who doesn't have to put on a persona of niceness, to put on a persona of niceness, I tend to believe that it's genuine. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, there's guys like Terrell Owens or Chad Ocho Cinco. Not his real name. Did you know about Chad Ocho Cinco? Not his real name. I don't. Oh my gosh, the guy's name's Chad Johnson, right? But his number is Ocho Cinco, yes, which eight, would be eighty-five six. I believe <laughs> his number is 85 years. and at some point during his career they came up with his nickname calling him Ocho Cinco and he apparently liked this nickname enough that he wanted the NFL to put it on the back of his jersey and the NFL said you get your last name on the back of your jersey everybody gets their last name that's just what you get and so he says Fine then, and he went down to the freaking courthouse, his name? changed his name to Chad Ocho Cinco, and then the team traded him, and he got a totally new number. Oh, boy, <laughs> yeah. it was his team fix, traded right? him, and eighty-five was taken. <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't get come up and like he should have. But oh my gosh, that is the worst, most ridiculous thing in the world. But you know, he's got Ocho Cinco on the back of his jersey now. He won. He got what he wanted. He sure as hell didn't get a Super Bowl, but he got the Idiot Award. And, you know, in the the long run, I, he, I'm sure he'll treasure the Idiot Award more. Yeah, I, I think Super so. Super Bowls come and go. They do. They have one every year. But you only get an Idiot Award when it's earned. They don't even give them out every year. <laughs> so, yeah, there are a lot of douchebags out there among... I mean, we were talking just today about Sean Penn. Yeah, I think regardless of how talented an actor he is... Uh, people recognize that the guy is something of an yeah. arse. It just comes off like that, you know. We we, we were just mentioning Ricky Gervais's uh, caustic humor from the Golden Globes and uh, how most people managed to take it with some a dignity, a, oh. a grain of salt. They managed to get up there and, and chuckle along. along with them instead of being a douche and getting all upset and offended and like, oh, how dare you? I am Sean Penn. I think it was... Uh, Robert Downey Jr. we were talking about who 
you know, the worst parts of his life were brought up in his introduction and he managed to get up there and just give a little back instead. And uh, then there was a few years ago when Chris Rock was hosting the uh, Oscars and he says, who the hell is Jude Law? And why is he in every single movie there he is? And, uh, and then when Sean Penn won, he went up and during his speech, instead yeah. of thanking people, he said, I'll have you know that Jude Law is a very talented actor. Yeah, he's one of the most talented actors of our generation. And just he's like, hung like a... She's like, dude, seriously, get over yourself. Why are you going to be such a douche? In the end, it's just going to shine through. Whatever you are, people will know. You're not going to be able to fool them. It's like when uh, that man uh, was accused of killing buckwheat. And they were interviewing his neighbors, you know, his childhood friends. And they'd all talk about what a gentle guy he was, you know, how clever he was, you know, quiet type, kept to himself. And then the interviewer would always ask, do you think he killed Buckwheat? And they'd all say, oh, oh, yes, definitely. Really? Maybe I'll cut that part out. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you need a hand? Muscles. Necessary. Apparently Big is working on his musculature. Yeah. Right as I. Something needs to be done. I ran on the treadmill two days in a row, and I feel like I've been worked over by Ron Jeremy. So, it's just a... Sadly, that's how I feel as well. <sighs> it's not working out. But I'm going to keep at it, because that's what I've heard is the key, persistence. Oh, it's nice. See, I, I know myself, and I know I, I shan't keep at it. <laughs> Way to go. What, what was this recorded for? Uh... Bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 b